Hello, my name is Julian, and in this video, we're going to be looking at design methodologies that can help brands, services, and products contribute to improving the world we are in for as many people as possible. In the late 1950s, early 60s, there was a movement known as universal design, which thought about how buildings, products and urban spaces should be designed and built to be accessible to people, irrespective of age, ability or other factors. One of the most well-known examples of this thinking was designed by one of the founders of the movement, architect Ronald L. Mace, who designed the drop curb. This simple design maintained the distinction between pavement and road, whilst allowing access from and to the pavement for wheelchair users or anyone with mobility issues. An aspect of universal design is how design can communicate function. Specifically, how can we as a user of the product know how to interact with it? This might seem quite an easy thing to do, but have you ever walked up to a door, tried to push it open when in fact you had to pull? The Design of Everyday Things, written by Donald A. Norman, is a great book if you want to learn more about this subject. I've put a link in the description below. Universal Design set out seven principles that should be considered when looking at designing outputs. These are, number one, equitable use, ensuring the design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. Number two, flexibility in use, allowing a wide range of individual preferences and abilities through the design. Number three, ensuring it's simple and intuitive to use, making the design as intuitive as possible, irregardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration levels. Principle four, perceptible information. Considering how the ambient conditions might make communication harder and adjust the design to respond to these issues. Number five, tolerance for error. Reduce accidental or unintended actions of the product through its design. Principle six, low physical effort. The design should consider how it can be as efficient and comfortable for the user and used with a minimum amount of fatigue. Principle seven, size and space for approach and use. Ensure enough space is provided for approach, reach, manipulation and use, irregardless of the user's body size, posture or mobility. These principles were later iterated on in 2012 by the Center of Inclusive Design and Environmental Access at the University of Buffalo, who incorporated health, well-being, and cultural appropriateness. A decade or so on in the late 1970s, an explosion of new products were being designed, built, and sold, mostly in the new wonder material of plastic, which now made almost any shape possible. Aesthetics were often seen as the most important thing, with usability a distant second. User-centered design was the response to this, which focused on the needs of the user. User-centered design continues to develop up to this day, most recently becoming more aligned with software design and digital service design. I hope you're enjoying the video. If you are, please give us a thumbs up and do consider subscribing. It really helps us out. Design thinking had existed since the 1950s, with one of the main practitioners of this methodology being American design studio IDEO. Fast forward to the 1990s, and they had built on these principles and introduced the world to human-centered design. The story behind this is an interesting one, and from a designer's perspective, one that reminds us of the impact our work can have. The story revolves around the humble plastic toothbrush. In this case, an Oral-B one that CEO of IDEO, Tim Brown, had designed previously. One of his colleagues found one of these toothbrushes washed up on the shoreline and brought it to the studio. This battered and chipped brush brought it home to Tim, the impact waste products were having on the natural environment. This realization moved him to start looking at how IDEO could evolve as a design studio to one that makes positive change in the world. And with this thinking, a new design framework was born and became known as human-centered design. If you'd like to read more about this type of thinking, Tim wrote a book called Change by Design back in 2009. I've put a link in the description below. So how does human-centered and user-centered design differ? Well, that's not an easy question to answer. We would argue some of the case studies shared around human-centered design could just as easily be really good examples of user-centered design. So here are our four main differences. Number one, the human-centered design process is outlined as inspiration, ideation, implementation. So a slightly simpler version of the user-centered approach, which is normally research, define, design, evaluate, and iterate. Number two, 
Human-centered design isn't the preserve of just practicing designers. Anyone can do human-centered design. Number three, human-centered generally knows the problem, but not necessarily the output, whereas user-centered has already established what the output will be. Number four, human-centered often deals with interconnected systems which involve multiple groups. This quote from Bill Torbert sums it up pretty well. If you're not part of the problem, you can't be part of the solution. An example of a human-centered design problem for us would be that of homelessness. There are so many different groups that would need to be involved when trying to reduce homelessness. They would have to be a human-centered problem. Also, while the problem is known, there are no obvious outputs that would be clear ways of solving this problem. Finally, if we were to use a user-centered design approach, then it is likely we would just move the problem along. Or we could create outputs in one area of the country or city that would be incompatible with neighboring areas. So what for the future? With large organizations having to already report on emissions, water usage and recycling, could the next methodology bring together the needs of the group and the environmental impact? This would allow us to see the immediate and future consequences of the systems, products and services we design and build. 